All right, now, John chapter 19, obviously there's a lot of content. There's no way we're going to be able to get to everything in this chapter tonight just because there's so much. I mean, you could preach entire sermons on, on so many topics that are here. But the main theme, obviously, we just read it. The, ma the main event that happens here is the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. And I'm, we're going to go a lot into this. Um, keep your finger here in John 19. I kind of just want to go back. We're going to read Isaiah 53. And um, this is one event that happens that probably fulfills the most Old Testament scripture in the whole Bible. Like of all the events that happen, you can see where things happen and they'll, and they'll quote a scripture. You know, when Jesus went in and uh, tipped over the, the tables of the money changers, they said, you know, that fulfilled the, the, um, the zeal of that house had eaten me up. You know, there, there's, there's scriptures that, have, that he's fulfilled along the way. But we see, and especially in all the other accounts as well, so much scripture being fulfilled in this one event. I mean, because because this is like the pinnacle. This is this is a huge event. Obviously, this and then the resurrection. You have you have this crucifixion of Jesus Christ. Is is his whole ministry coming to a head to this one event? Which I mean, this combined with the resurrection. I just, you know, I'm going to refer to that as kind of the one package thing, right? But um, we see even in this passage that we read. Um, Fulfilling scripture, fulfilling scripture, fulfilling scripture over and over again. It's, it's quoting from the Old Testament. And we're going to see here in Isaiah 53. Um, what, what I want to do to start with is we need to get our, our mind around what happened to Jesus Christ. And I did this once before about a year ago when I preached on the appreciation for the free gift. It was our Christmas sermon. And um, I believe that was another Wednesday night. And... It's always good to reflect and to take the time and to make this story real about what Jesus said. Because it's so easy to read over these verses. Verse number one in, in John 19, you don't have to flip back there. It just says, Then Pilate therefore took Jesus and scourged him. And then you just keep on reading. It says, And the soldiers, you know, and all this stuff happened to him. It's easy to read over these things. Especially if you're doing your daily Bible reading. You just read, Yeah, then Pilate took Jesus and scourged him. And you just keep on going and going and going. Okay, when it says they scourged him, think about that for a minute, because what that means is they whipped him. They, Jesus was arrested. He was under their control. They set him somewhere. I don't know if they spread his arms out or whatever. And they took a whip and they whipped his back. Or, and, and I think it got to his front too, because we're going to see that here in Isaiah 53. You can't just read over these things because all in, in just the first few verses of John chapter 19, they do some really horrible things to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And, and we can't just read over this stuff. What he did, the sacrifice that he made is incredible. Let's just, we're going to read through Isaiah 53, um, starting in verse number one. The Bible reads, Who hath believed our report, and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. This is talking about Jesus Christ, mind you, that he wasn't some like really handsome, beautiful man that just stood out. It's like, wow, look at that guy. He's, you know, he's amazingly just, just a beautiful person just in, in looks, right? Just, he has no form or comeliness and that when you look at him, no beauty, when you're going to be like, oh, wow, you know, he didn't stand out that way at all. Verse number three says, he is despised and rejected of men a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Jesus was a man of sorrows. He knew grief very well. Anyone who's ever been rejected even one time in their life knows what that, that type of a feeling is. But this is the Son of Man and, and he's, he's doing something that, that everyone has no comprehension of what he's doing. No clue. And a lot of people, that's why he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do when people are doing things ignorantly to him. The Roman soldiers who were, who were just, I mean, they were doing their job, but they were, I mean, obviously they shouldn't have been doing it. It was, it was unjust what they were doing, but they did it ignorantly. They didn't know what they were doing. So Jesus still, even in that condition, even as he's rejected, even though he's a man of sorrows, even though all of this stuff, he still has that love and that forgiveness in his heart. But he says, look, we didn't esteem him. Let's keep reading here. We're, we're going to see a, this really gets in-depth into, into Jesus Christ and, and more details about this event that happens here. 
Verse number four, Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. This is talking about everything that he's doing here, all these things that happened to him. In a way, you could say it's because of you. It's because of me. It's because of your sins. Jesus went through all of this stuff and he had to go through all this stuff because of your sins. This should give you a second thought when you, especially knowingly or willfully, are going to commit a sin. Pray to God that, that the Holy Spirit will, will let this, this chapter, these chapters ring true in your mind and say, you know what? Why would I go and do it? Jesus Christ did all this stuff because of that. I don't want to add to that. I mean, I know it's already done in the past, but, but it should give you a proper perspective about sin, for one, and about how horrible it is. And, and Jesus had to go through all those things. Is it really worth it for, for whatever deceitful pleasure that, that you think you're going to get out of, out of whatever sin that you're going to commit? Let's keep reading here. This was all because of us. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. It's for our sins. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. With his stripes we are healed. Verse 6, All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed. And he was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before her shearers is dumb. So he openeth not his mouth. And you notice that too. There comes a point where Jesus doesn't talk. He doesn't talk to Pilate. We're, we're gonna, we'll get into that a little bit. He stops answering. And he just, he goes with it. I mean, he, they, they take him and crucify him and he doesn't put up a fight. He doesn't, he doesn't try to talk his way out of it. As a sheep before his shearers is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. Verse number 8 says, He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. I mean, over and over again, for the tr transgression of my people, you know, for our iniquities, all these things, it's because of our sins he went through all this stuff. Verse 9, And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see of the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many. For he shall bear their iniquities. Again, talking about him bearing our iniquities. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressor, transgressors. And we notice here in two places as well, in Isaiah 53, he poured out his soul unto death, and it says that his soul was made an offering for sin. It's, it wasn't just the, the, the physical sacrifice of his body that Jesus made that, that was the full atonement for our sins. The Bible records that his soul actually went to hell. When Jesus bare our sins in his body, the three days and the three nights that he was dead upon the earth, his soul was in hell. He paid, literally paid the punishment that we deserve to pay for our sins. And, and we see here everything he went through, even getting up to that point. Up to the point where God forsakes him, and we'll get into that a little bit too. That's not written in this chapter, it's found in other accounts, where he says, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? But um, we see that in Isaiah 53, when it says, Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. It pleased God to do what he did. And obviously, the pleasure would come from the end result of that. It pleased God that... And think about this. Is, this is the Son of God. And, and all of this, the wrath and everything else is poured out because He's bearing our sins. But it pleased God to do that. 
This is probably the only in, in, instance where God is, is pleased with, with inflicting that, that on a person um, because he knows that this now is going to be the salvation for, for everyone that believes is, is because of what Jesus did. And, um, <clears throat> but we see here in Isaiah 53, go back to John 19, we see that he's a man of sorrows. We see some of the, a little bit more detail into, into him being oppressed and afflicted. And over and over again, we're, we're taught that it's because of us. It's because of our sins. He, he went through all this stuff for our transgressions. He did it to pay the price for our sins. But let's, um, let's get back into the story here. I don't wanna, we don't want to pass over that, that they scourged him because this is the first thing they do. They have him arrested. He's arrested falsely and they whip him. They scourge him. Verse number two, it says, And the soldiers platted a crown of thorns and put it on his head. Now, again, I'm not going to keep turning. There's so much to get to. We're not going to be flipping back and forth. I'm going to be making references. You should look them up um, at, your, at your leisure when you get home. Mark 15, Matthew 27. You know, look up these other accounts of, of the crucifixion. But you see these pictures of Jesus Christ that people, that artists will make. First of all, they make him with long hair, which is a sin in and of itself. The Bible says, you know, doth not nature itself teach you that it's a shame for a man to have long hair? Jesus did not have long hair. But you see these pictures of Jesus, and they have this, 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 this crown of thorns on his head. And usually, not all the time, but usually it's just kind of like, like sitting on his head, like just kind of resting there. But they made this crown of thorns for a reason. They're being brutal. Okay, they're, they're not in any way just, just trying to decorate him up. They're decorating him up in a way that's mocking and disparaging. And the reason why they use thorns is because of, they, they put that thorn, crown of thorns on his head to hurt him. And not only did they put that crown of thorns on his head, you can read in the other accounts, they were beating him with a rod on his head that already had that crown of thorns on his head. So he's got this, this, this crown that they made with these thorns just, just jabbing into his head every time they beat him. Now, if you know anything about head wounds, you know, when you get a little, even little, the smallest of cuts, you start bleeding profusely from your head. Think about all the cuts that he must have had. They started hitting him over the head with the rod. He had the crown of thorns on his head and it's just being blasted into his head. They'd already whipped him. It says they put on his head and, and they made him a purple robe. So now they're just making fun of him. Because, you know, he, the, he's the king of the Jews, right? And that's the, the sign that they put up over his head, which is supposed to be mocking and ridiculing his position, which he truly was the king. He's the king of kings and lord of lords. Yet they're just saying, oh, we'll put a purple robe on him because, you know, obviously purple robe would be like a kingly attire. And, but they beat him first. So they get him all bloodied. They whip him. And then they put this purple robe on him and said, hail, king of the Jews. And they smote him with their hands. So then they just start punching him. He's already bloodied in the head. He's already been whipped. He's got this robe on. And then they just go boom and just start, just start hitting him. Just start smiting him with their hands. The son of God on this earth. This is how he's being treated. By a, by a gang of thugs. And then it says in verse 4, Pilate therefore went forth again and saith unto them, Behold, I bring him forth to you that ye may know that I find no fault in him. And see, here we see Pilate, the, the typical politician, who's just trying to appease the crowd, appease the masses. If you didn't find any fault in him, Pilate, then why is he getting whipped and beat up and, and, and mocked and rickled? And it says in other places that he was spit in his face. I mean, think about that, getting beaten and bloodied and then people just spitting right in your face. Jesus put up with that. And this is someone that we, we saw in the last chapter. He didn't have to do that. He could call at any moment and, and God would bring legions of angels and he would have no problem getting out of this situation. Think about the patience that he must have and, and, the, and the endurance to be able to go through what he went through here, the things that he had to endure. And he patiently endured that. I, I can't say that, that I would have the same reaction that Jesus did if, if I were going through a trial like this. The whipping and beating and the spitting and the mocking, I mean, that's, that's enough to, to break a normal person. 
and and he but he went through it and he did it especially knowing he had an out he didn't take that out he he went through it and, and finished the course but let's keep reading here it says you know Pilate says look I didn't find any fault in him yet he he did all this stuff to him and he's trying to get the crowd to let him go is what he's trying he's trying to 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 appease the anger that the the people had to where he doesn't really have to put him to death but He's not, he's not, obviously not a just person whatsoever for allowing this stuff to happen. Verse number five says, Then came Jesus forth, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, and Pilate saith unto them, Behold the man. So he's saying, look at him. You know, look at him. He's bloodied. He's beaten. He's been whipped. He's got a crown of thorns on his head. Look at the guy. Like, just look at him. Look at the reaction. Verse number six. When the chief priests, therefore, and officers saw him, they cried out, saying, Crucify him. Crucify him. That wasn't enough for him. That probably just got him even more bloodthirsty. These bloody men. And it's, it's careful to point out as the chief priests and officers. The chief priests were the ones behind this. They were the ones that wanted him dead to begin with. These are the Pharisees. These are... The, the rulers of the Judaism religion that is even around to this day. The Christ-rejecting Pharisees that just wanted his blood, that their, their blood boiled in, in anger at what Jesus represented, what he was saying and claiming to be. They hated him so much that even when they saw him in that state of just being bloodied and whipped and beaten, they, they just wanted him dead. They said, crucify him. That's not enough to appease their anger and their wrath. And then Pilate says, well, take ye him and crucify him, for I find no fault in him. He said, well, you just go ahead and do that because I, I don't find any fault in this man. But they didn't want to do that. And verse 7 says, the Jews answered him, we have a law, and by our law he ought to die because he made himself the son of God. This is why they hated him. This is exactly why. This is why they wanted him dead, because they said, look, he made himself the son of God, which makes him equal with God. He needs to die. He needs to be put to death. And they're, and they're basically saying, like, we don't have the authority to put someone to death. You know that, you know, under rule. So we need you to put him to death. And this is why. Because and, and they're not coming up with these false accusations anymore. They're saying he made himself the son of God. They're coming out with, what they, with the reason why they really want to kill him. Pilate gets scared when he hears that. It says in verse 8, he says, When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he was the more afraid. Now we already hear in, in, um, in another, one of the other Gospels, Pilate's warned by his wife. He's saying, she's saying, you know, have nothing to do with that, with that I, know, I forgot what it was, that innocent man, because she had suffered many things in a dream that night. So she's like, she, I had dreams, you know, like, don't, don't mess with this. You know, don't, don't do anything with that guy. He didn't do anything wrong. And so he's getting these other things. And, and he didn't find any fault with, with what Jesus did. He knew that the chief priest had, had offered him up for envy. He knew the, the real reason why they were, they were delivering him up. He knew that Jesus didn't do anything wrong. And now he's hearing, wait, this is the Son of God? At least he's claiming to be the Son of God? You better think twice before you do what you do. And when all of a sudden, you, this isn't just a, a normal person that you're, you're about to condemn to death. This is the Son of God. Now that made him afraid, but that still wasn't good enough. For, obviously for Pilate, because he ended up executing him anyways. Verse number 9 says, And went again unto the judgment hall, and saith unto Jesus, Whence art thou? So now he goes back, he's here like, Wait, wh where are you from? He's trying to talk to Jesus. Now, of course, he's trying to talk to him after he's already had him whipped and beaten and everything else, and now he expects Jesus just to answer him. But look at this, it says, But Jesus gave him no answer. There comes a point in people's lives, and I think this is just um, an abstract way of looking at it, but it's, it's kind of um, shows another truth to where there are some people that Jesus just will stop responding to. That once you cross a line, that's it. Because people have this mentality, they like to think that there's always hope. Jesus is always there listening to, to you. He's always ready to answer your prayers. He's always there all the time, no matter what, for everybody in the whole world. And that's simply not true. It wasn't true for Pilate. 
And Pilate starts to actually ask him, well, wait, where are you from? And he tries it, because now he's questioning more along the lines of the Son of God. Right? He's not just asking him about, did you commit this crime? He's saying, well, wait, where are you from? Jesus gave him no answer. There's a, Pilate had his chance. He's, he had plenty of chances. He decided to have him whipped and beaten, even though he knew he didn't do anything wrong. And um, it's an important truth to, to, to understand that there's, there's some people where Jesus just, he's done. He gives no answer to him. But let's keep reading. Verse number 10 says, Then saith Pilate unto him, Speakest thou not unto me? Knowest thou not that I have power to crucify, crucify thee and have power to release thee? This is where Jesus answers him. Verse number 11 says, Jesus answered, Thou couldst have no power at all against me, except it were given thee from above. Therefore, he that delivered me unto thee hath the greater sin. He says, wait, wait, wait. Don't think that that's your own power that you have, buddy. Because the only reason at all that you are able to do these things is because God's allowing you to do this. And we ought to be mindful of that as well. I don't know, you know, I don't think anyone here is in such great high positions of authority or anything like that over a whole bunch of people. But God will humble you. If you, are, if you ever get in that position or if you are in a position where you start letting that authority and that power get to your head, like Nebuchadnezzar, when God had to bring him low and make him like the beasts and he was just outside in the fields eating grass and it says his hair became like feathers and his, his fingernails grew like talons, of, like, like a bird's. And, and because he got lifted up with pride saying, you know, look at this great kingdom, you know, and thinking that it's all him that did this when really God was using him to bring judgment on a bunch of other heathen nations, a bunch of wicked nations. He was using that. And um, the only reason he was even in that position at all is because God was allowing it to happen. And... Um, Jesus explains that very truth right here. He says, look, you couldn't have any power at all unless God, unless God gave it to you. Look, God, God's allowing this to happen. And um, another point on this verse, he says, therefore he that delivered me unto thee hath the greater sin. Now, a lot of, there's a false concept out there where people think that, well, sin is sin. That all sin is equal. If all sin is equal, then why would Jesus say that, that he hath the greater sin? that it's even more, it's worse, it's, it, it's more sinful. See, not all sin is equal. And the reason why people, I think, have gone to that, to, to make that type of a conclusion or that type of a statement is because of the fact that even the smallest sin that you commit is worthy of a punishment of hell. Okay? That is true. We see that, the, you know, the Bible says in um, Revelation 20, 28, 21.8, that um, the fearful, unbelieving, abominable, sorcerers, murderers, whoremongers, all these different people, all liars, shall have their part in the lake which burns the fire and brimstone. So, you know, there's, there's all these different sins and lists murderers and liars all in the same sentence and say, hey, look, you all deserve hell. And that is true. But the Bible also talks about the lowest hell and the deepest, you know, the, the, the lowest levels. And it also talks about receiving rewards in heaven and, and, and gaining more things. So um, just because any one sin is enough to send a person to hell doesn't mean that all sins are equal. Obviously, God has different judgments that he's, he's designed for sins. In the Old Testament, you look at the law. You know, not every, not every break, you know, um, transgression of the law was worthy of the death penalty, for example. Right? If you stole some, you know, a thief would have to pay sevenfold. Or whatever, you know, they'd have to pay back a lot more than what they took. Um, there's all kinds of different transgressions that people can commit and make against the other. Some of them were the death penalty. You know, if you commit adultery, that's the death penalty. That's the judgment. But not all sin is equal. And we have to just understand that, that yes, there are certain sins that are worse than others. You know, you, know, you hear commonly, if you look on a woman with lust after you've committed adultery with her already in your heart, that's true, and that's wicked, and that's bad, and that's a sin, and we need to, to, to take that verse to heart and realize that. But I'll tell you what, my friends, looking at a woman with lust is not the same thing as actually committing the act and going through with it. You may have done it in your heart, but that is not the same level of sin when you actually follow through with the action and do something. Are they both sins? Yes. Would both sins be enough to send a person to hell? Yes. 
but one is a lot worse than the other one. And that's why he's, he's explaining to Pilate right now, even because was Pilate sinning? Yes. When he was condemning Jesus Christ, yes, Pilate sinned. But you know who sinned even more? The, the traitor. Judas, who betrayed Jesus Christ and then delivered him up to Pilate. And the chief priests who are delivering him up to Pilate and saying, crucify him, crucify him, and basically trying to force Pilate to do what he's doing. They're saying, they've got the greater sin. Now, well, let's keep moving on because I don't want to, we've got a lot to get through. And, um, but let's just understand that that don't don't get caught up with this mindset that all sin is equal because it's not. There are sins that are worse than others, and he, Jesus Christ said so right here. Verse number twelve it says, "And from thenceforth Pilate sought to release him." So Pilate now wants to let him go. At first he didn't care. Like he was just like, "Whatever, I'll whip." Because he's he's a wicked man. He's like, "Well, I'll just beat this guy. Maybe that'll appease him and send him away, and then it'll, this all just blow over and be done." Then he hears he's the son of God. And then he goes and tries to talk to Jesus. And Jesus is like, look, you wouldn't have any power at all. Except it were given thee from above. And he's like, now he's like scared. And he's like, you know what? I just want to let this guy go. But, but, to look what it says, but the Jews cried out saying, if thou let this man go, thou art not Caesar's friend. So now they're making him come down to this, to this conclusion. Say, okay, who are you obedient to? Are you going to obey Caesar? Or, or are you on this guy's side? You know, they're, just, they're just making it like a choice between Jesus and Caesar. Hey, if you have that choice between Jesus and Caesar, pick Jesus. Okay? If, you, if you ever come down to that position to where you know, people are, are you know, maybe, maybe it's, it's a, telling you to renounce your faith or something. I don't know. I mean, when the Antichrist comes into power, they're going to be martyring Christians and, and probably trying to get people to renounce their faith. Hey, look, if it's between the, the evil head of the, the one world, the new world order, or, or the one world government, or Jesus, big Jesus. I mean, Pilate picked wrong here, but they were trying to just, just force him into this point to where he can't back out of it. So they say, they say this then, whosoever maketh himself a king speaketh against Caesar. So they're saying, look, he said he's the king. And we only have one king, there's Caesar. You know, you can't, if you're going to start, if you're going to let this guy go, then you are not Caesar's friend. And he feared, ultimately, Caesar, or um, excuse, Pilate feared man more than he feared God. Because he made this decision. Then when he heard that, that's what it says in verse 13, when Pilate therefore heard that saying, he brought Jesus forth and sat down in the judgment seat in a place that is called the pavement, but in Hebrew, Gabbatha. And it was the preparation of the Passover in about the sixth hour. And he saith unto the Jews, Behold your king. So, now he's trying to, to turn it back around again because they're saying, look, he made himself a king, so you're not going to be Caesar's friend. He's already decided now he's going he's he's to he's submit to their will, but now he's trying to, to still save face and throw it back to him. Say, okay, well, behold your king. You know, he made himself a king. Behold your king. Verse 15, but they cried out, away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate saith unto them, shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, we have no king but Caesar. Look at that. The chief priests. The chief priests, the religious leaders, said, we have no king but Caesar. That's who they're... And you know what? We, we saw earlier that that's what their, their fear was from anyways. They said, well, when the Romans hear this, what about our position? What about our place? You know, when... when because of what Jesus was doing and, and everything that he was... Um, the followers that he was gaining... They were worried about losing their position and losing their status and losing their role in their governorship of, of the, the small area that they had control over. That's what they cared about, and they're, they're actually just being honest here. We have no king but Caesar. That's true, because God was not their king. God was not their ruler. They rejected God. Then delivered he him, therefore, unto them to be crucified, and they took Jesus and led him away. And he, bearing his cross, went forth into a place called the place of a skull, which is called in the Hebrew Golgotha, where they crucified him and two other with him, on either side one, and Jesus in the midst. And, you know, just adding more insult to his injury is just making the guy carry his own death instrument. It's like digging your own ditch, right? They whip him, they beat him up, they do all this stuff, and then they say, okay, now you're going to carry this cross that we're going to nail you to, that's going to ultimately be... The, the way you're going to die. 
He said, we're not going to carry up there. You do it. Now, obviously, we learn another, in another scripture that he couldn't, he couldn't even physically do it. They had to get another man to, to, to carry the cross for him. But um, they started off here with him bearing his own cross and, and, and trying to go up that hill to, um, to Calvary. But it says, They crucified him and two other with him on either side one, and Jesus in the midst. Verse 19, And Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross, and the writing was, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. This title then read many of the Jews, for the place where Jesus was crucified was nigh to the city, and it was written in Hebrew and Greek and Latin. Then said the chief priests of the Jews to Pilate, Write not the King of the Jews, but that he said, I am King of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. Now, that title is true. He was the king of the Jews, right? I mean, he, that, that, what, what Pilate wrote up there was true. It says he wrote it in um, Greek and Hebrew and Latin. And, um, you know, they were all upset because they're saying, oh, he's not, you know, he's not our king, so don't write the king of the Jews. Just write that he said that he's the king of the Jews. And they were upset about this. But, um, no, I believe that, that what was written there was, was there for a reason. Um, because, it, because it is true. Now, they, they did it in a, in a mocking, disparaging way, again. But um, think about that, that picture. Just think about that image of, uh, of Jesus Christ, who's already been bloodied immensely and beaten and whipped, and his hands and his feet are nailed to a cross and hanging there. And they put this sign up, you know, this cute little sign, saying, oh yeah, ha ha, he's the king of the Jews. And then people would come, and they were shaking their heads, the Bible says, and, and reviling him, and mocking him, and ridiculing him. And this is the Son of Man, this is the Savior of the world. And this is how he was treated. Verse number 23 says, Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his garments, and made four parts to every soldier apart, and also his coat. Now the coat was without seam woven from the top throughout. They said, therefore, among themselves, let us not rend it, but cast lots for it, whose it shall be, that the scripture might be fulfilled, which saith, they parted my raiment among them, and for my vesture they did cast lots. These things, therefore, the soldiers did. Um, and we're, it, it's amazing how all these events happen. Like you'd think that at the time, I'm sure no one was putting this stuff together. Right, it was probably it may have even been a common practice. I don't know among the soldiers, but um, to just be like vultures and taking whatever they can because Jesus was going to die. So they're saying, okay, well, you know, we're gonna we're gonna get his clothing. So they divided up his garments. It says, but his coat, you know, they couldn't divide that up because it would just ruin it. It was it was woven throughout. It was one one big piece like a poncho or whatever. You pull that over, and um, it, it was really nice, so they said they were gonna they were gonna cast lots. They were gonna, you know, determine, gamble, or whatever, figure out who was gonna get the whole thing, right? By chance, they were gonna just see, okay, it belongs to this person, and um, they did that. But this was fulfilling scripture. So, like, even down to the point where there where the soldiers are there, and they're dividing up his garments, all these different things, and you start to see that we're gonna see a lot more of this too. All, every single event that happened, like all these, these seeming, seemingly meaningless things that would be going on, if you put yourself in the story, you see Jesus Christ hanging there, obviously you could be focused on that, but, but then you see these soldiers and they're you know, dividing up his clothing and stuff. All of this was prophesied in way, way, way in advance. Way before Jesus ever got crazy. This was all already written in Scripture. And this is how incredible, this is why the, the Bible is incredible. It's the Word of God. Because these things come to pass, and it's not even realized until later on. Like, why hey, this happened and this happened, and you know, the disciples start putting it together, and their and their their understanding is opened by God after the resurrection. There's all these different things that are coming to their mind, saying, "Oh yeah, can you believe that?" And then, oh yeah, there's this other scripture. Remember, it says that they were going to cast lots. They're going to do this. They were doing that, you know, and all these different things that were really happening completely fulfilling this prophecy so that there's no doubt whatsoever of who Jesus was. Even, even if the miracles weren't enough, the fact that he fulfilled 
all of this scripture. That valid that validated Isaiah, that validates David, it validates you know, Ezekiel, it validates all of these Old Testament prophets, Moses, they're all validated mainly by this one big event. I mean, we read Isaiah 53. All of these things, all those things happened. They came to pass exactly as they're written without anything being left undone when Jesus did this. So it says in verse 25, Now there stood by the cross of Jesus his mother and his mother's sister Mary, the wife of Cleophas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple standing by whom he loved, he saith unto his mother, Woman, behold thy son. Then saith he to the disciple, Behold thy mother. And from that hour that disciple took her unto his own home. Now, I don't believe that anything is in the Bible by accident. Everything that's, that's recorded is here for a very specific reason. And I'm going to be honest with you tonight because I don't know exactly why this is recorded in Scripture, but I, am, I would really, really love to find out. So if anyone has any thoughts on this, I'd love to hear them after the service. But um, there are a few things we can learn from this. It, apparently, it looks like Joseph, Jesus' stepdad, is out of the, out of the picture. That he, he must have passed away. Because basically, Jesus is saying to, his, to Mary, Behold your son, and to this is, he's talking to the Apostle John. Um, I'm not even going to get into why, to, to proving that. You could ask me after the service and I'll show you why. Um, this is talking about John. He's the, you know, the author of this, of this book that we're reading. And he says to John, you know, behold thy mother. And he says, from that day forward, then he, Mary went to stay with John and John took care of her as his own mother. And there's a few things we can learn from this. One, we can learn that I believe that Jesus was taking care of his mother. Because if he wasn't going to be there, now he had to have somebody else lined up to take care of his own mother for him. Because he's not going to be there anymore to, to, to physically do that, to, to take on that role. Um, you know, there's a lot of, I, I, I've heard from, from parents that, you know, they don't ever want their, their children to take care of them when they get old. But that is the biblical, that is the job and the responsibility of of the children eventually is to take care of their parents. Your parents take care of your children and you know, as a parent you should you know, lay up for your children, you should, you should provide for them and do everything that you need to do for them, but there's going to come a point to where you are going to go into a place of need probably if you live long enough depending on how your life goes and it will then fall upon your children, their duty and their responsibilities then to take care of you. And that is biblical, and, that, and that's what we see. I believe Jesus did this, and he was assigning now this responsibility unto John. And what I find interesting is that, what about the rest of Jesus' siblings? What about James, the brother of Jesus? What about some of his other people? Why, why weren't they picked to take care of Mary? I don't know. I just think it's kind of interesting. I wish I knew the answer to that, why, why he did that. But um, I've, been, I've been kicking this around for quite a while because there's really not much that I have seen other scriptural evidence. And I don't go to outside sources outside of the Bible to find the truth about things um, because anything else, a history book, textbooks, they're all written by man and they all can be corrupted. And I don't want to start, start believing in a fairy tale. If something just isn't true, if something, if someone just makes, because it's so easy for someone to make something up. I mean, you could probably hear lots of reasons for this that just came out of the heart of man that someone just thought up and said, well, hey, this might make sense. And they, they write it down in a book and people start quoting that book as being fact. I don't know that that's true. So when I, when I, if I'm going to believe anything, I want it to come from this book. And this is where I try to get all, all of my teaching from, is from God's word. But it's just really interesting that he said that. And um, we see here, he passes that responsibility on to John, and we could also pr fairly assume that, that Joseph is no longer a lo a present at this time because why wouldn't his, her husband take care of her? And she would go to live with, with John as, you know, as, as his mother. Um, anyways, that's really interesting, and if you have any more insight into that, please let me know after service because I, I love this that that's there, but I don't quite fully get why it's there. Everything is there for a reason. Verse number 28 says, After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, saith, or excuse me, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled. Again, that the scripture might be fulfilled, saith, I thirst. So he even, he even has opened up his mouth and says, I, I'm thirsty. 
because he needs to have this scripture fulfilled. Verse 29, it says, Now there was set a vessel full of vinegar, and they filled a sponge with vinegar, and put it upon hyssop, and put it to his mouth. When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. And, um, oh man, there's so much I wanted to get to. Let's, I'm going to get into this hyssop a little bit because <clears throat> basically, so here we're at the end. Jesus is on the cross. He says, I thirst. They go and get vinegar and they, they soak up a sponge. They put it on, on a reed. The reed is, must have been made of this hyssop. And they, they put it up, they reach it up to him so he could, because he's hanging up on the cross above people, so that he can take a drink of this. And um, this is another fulfillment of scripture. And then when, then when he received that, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. Now, what I found interesting about hyssop is that it's only mentioned a few times in the Bible. It's mentioned in the Old Testament. If you could, you could turn there, if you'd like, turn to. Um, Leviticus 14. One of the things that hyssop was used for in the Bible was for cleansing. And the Bible says in Psalm 51, 7, Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Um, and it was also used with the sacrifice that a leper would make when he was cleansed from his leprosy. And the Bible says in Leviticus 14, verse number 4, it says, Then shall the priest command to take for him that is to be cleansed two birds alive and clean, and cedar wood, and scarlet, and hyssop. And the priest shall command that one of the birds be killed in an earthen vessel over running water, as for the living bird, he shall take it and the cedar wood and the scarlet and the hyssop and shall dip them and the living bird in the blood of the bird that was killed over the running water. And he shall sprinkle upon him that is to be cleansed from the leprosy seven times and shall pronounce him clean and shall let the living bird loose into the open field. Now here, I think this is a loose um, association with, with Jesus Christ, with the hyssop being brought to him. He's got, you got the cedar wood, the like cedar wood, scarlet, hyssop, and the sacrifice. And you have Jesus Christ. He's obviously on a wooden cross. Scarlet, he's bleeding, he's bloody, and he's a living sacrifice. And now they're putting sip of, hyssop up to his mouth um, when he's receiving the vinegar. But even uh, a, a more closely related uh, reference with hyssop is that that's actually what they used to paint the blood on the doorposts at Passover. So remember when, when Passover happened and they killed the lamb, they would dip the, um, they would use hyssop with, to, get, to put the blood in and to, to, to put the blood on the doorposts. And again, Jesus Christ is the, the lamb, that sacrificial Passover lamb, and, and here we see them putting the hyssop up to his mouth. There, there's just these, these correlations with these things I think are, are pretty interesting in the Bible, and, and there's probably a lot more to be learned there too. But um, I'm going to stop with that because we're, um, we're getting close to being out of time. I want to keep going through this chapter. So he says, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. The Jews, therefore, because it was the preparation that the bodies should not remain upon the cross on the Sabbath day, for that Sabbath day was in high day, besought Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. Now, this is one of the reasons why they say, um, you know, Good Friday, you know, the, the Catholics and, and other people will believe that Jesus was crucified on a Friday because they, they say, oh, well, the, the next day was the Sabbath day. So it must have been a Friday. But what they don't understand is that, no, even from this verse, it says, for that Sabbath day was an high day. It wasn't just a normal Sabbath day that was the day following the, the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. It was an high day because it was, they were doing the preparation for the Passover. Now, they would refer to these holy days as Sabbaths. And you can prove that from the Bible. I'm not going to do it tonight. But um, you had the seventh day of the week was always it was called the Sabbath. That's what Sabbath means. It means seventh. So on the seventh day of the week, 
they would, it was a day of rest and they weren't allowed to do any work. But they also had these other feasts. Like what was going on here was the Passover. And then the, the day after the Passover began the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So the Passover was a high day. It was a holy day. It was considered a Sabbath. And as was the, the, the Feast of Unleavened Bread. They were both Sabbaths, and then they had the, the Saturday, which is a regular Sabbath. So when Jesus was crucified, he was actually dead and buried for three Sabbaths in a row, three consecutive Sabbaths, which, was, which is amazing. For the three days and three nights that Jesus Christ was dead, nobody on this earth was supposed to be doing any work because he did all the work for us, signifying again our salvation that, that is not based on our works at all. No one was allowed to do any work while he was in the grave. But um, this verse can, can help clear that up to say, well, that Sabbath day was a high day. It wasn't just the normal Sabbath. So when he was crucified, it was not on Good Friday. That's a lie. That's incorrect. It would have been more like a Wednesday night. And, I, and I'm not going to get into that. I, I preached on that when we did our um, um, closer to Easter when we had that sermon about, about his crucifixion and resurrection. But um, you can prove that from the Bible. But let's keep going. 32. So then came the soldiers and broke the legs of the first and of the other which was crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was dead already, they break not his legs. But one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side and forthwith came there out blood and water. And he that saw it bear record and his record is true. And he knoweth that he saith true that ye might believe. For these things were done that the scripture should be fulfilled. A bone of him shall not be broken. Again, another fulfillment of Scripture. And then it says in verse 37, And again, another Scripture saith, They shall look on him whom they pierced. So the fact that they didn't break his legs, even though that's what they were going to do to make him die quicker, is a fulfillment of Scripture. And the fact that the soldier just, instead of breaking his legs, says, Okay, well, I'm just going to pierce him and just make sure that he's dead, basically, to see if he moves or anything. And he just pierced him. Nope. And... Again, another fulfillment of Scripture. These guys had no idea what they were doing while they were fulfilling the Scripture. And because God knows the beginning from the end, He knew these events were all going to take place. That's why He was able to, to, to tell the holy men of God what they needed to preach and what they could say. And that's why they were able to prophesy, because God knows the end from the beginning. That's why we have the book of Revelation. It's going to happen that way. There is no altering this course. It's, it's going to happen. These things that are written in this book will happen exactly the way that the Bible says they're going to happen. And all these things that happened is just more proof. It, they pierced them. Why did, why did they even pierce them? Well, because it was written in Scripture. Because it was already there that these things were going to happen. And um, notice too, this is, this is just a real quick side note. Turn if you want to, keep your finger in, in John 19. We're almost done. First John chapter number 5 though. Because it says when he pierced them, what came out? It says water and blood. Right? And I thought that was real interesting too because there's another, th this verse comes into mind when, um, when you think of water and blood. At least it did for me. Chapter 5 of First John, when we look at the verse about the Trinity, Well, let's start reading in verse number 5. 1 John 5, 5 says, Who is he that overcometh the world, but he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God? This is he that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ. Not by water only, but by water and blood. It is the Spirit that beareth witness, because the Spirit is truth. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, and the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. This is where we get our doctrine of the Trinity, the three in one. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost. Yes, they are three, they are distinct, but they are one. It's, the, it's exactly what it's saying right here. But then look at the next verse, it says, And there are three that bear witness in earth. So it's saying in heaven there's three that bear record. Father, Son, Holy Ghost, this is, this is bearing record in heaven. But on the earth, it says there are three that bear witness in the earth, the spirit and the water and the blood, and these three agree in one. And you have to have the water and the blood is basically our physical body. This is, this is us being flesh. That's why Jesus Christ came by water and blood. He was physically born, and not just physically born from his mother's water breaking, but he was physically born 
in that he was flesh and blood. He was a human being completely while he was God in the flesh. And we have the Holy Spirit of God. We have a spirit inside of us. And when, so when we go and bear witness, we have the water and the blood already. But you need that spirit too. And these three agree in one is what it's saying here, that, that bear witness in the earth. So when we go out and bear witness of Jesus Christ, we're doing it obviously with our fleshly bodies, but with the spirit also. And um, I, I just thought that's kind of interesting. It's showing more, again, Jesus Christ being flesh and blood. And when he, they pierced him, blood and water came out. And that just made me think of First John chapter 5 there. But um, we're almost, actually I'm doing pretty good on time, a little bit better than I thought. There's a lot of stuff to cover. So let's keep reading here. Verse number 38 says, And after this, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, besought Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus, and Pilate gave him leave. He came therefore and took the body of Jesus. Now, it said, we learn elsewhere that Joseph was, he was a rich man. He, he was wealthy, but he was saved. He was obviously saved. It says he was a disciple, but he wasn't open about it. See, he, he feared the Jews. So he was, even though he was saved, he didn't, he didn't make it like a public thing. He did it um, secretly because he was afraid of, of the Jews. And um, it says, though, he came and took the body. And there came also Nicodemus, which at the first came to Jesus by night and brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pound weight. So here we see, you know, Nicodemus was another man, I think, that feared the Jews. I th and, I, and I preached this back in John chapter 3, how I believe Nicodemus was a saved man. There's a lot of evidence that, that he did end up believing. I mean, Jesus preached the gospel to him. Who knows if he got saved there or not. But we see him pop up a few times in Scripture. And the things that he's doing, he's basically defending Jesus. And here we see he's honoring him. And, you know, he came to Jesus by night. He didn't want people seeing him going and talking to Jesus, but he really wanted to know. I think he wanted to, he was honest with his communication, his conversation with Jesus. He wasn't like the chief priests and these other Pharisees that, that hated Jesus and just wanted him dead. He wanted to know the truth. And um, that's why I think that he got saved. But we see here, even these people who, um, they were afraid. They didn't want other people to know they were Christian, but they still were able to even play a small role in, in this whole thing. God can use you, even if you, you haven't been the most devout or the, or the most outspoken Christian, He can still use you in a good way. And I believe that these men were used in a good way because they were able to take the body. They, it says they wound it in linen clothes with the spices as the manner of the Jews is to bury um, and they, you know, this Joseph had, had purchased that, that sepulcher where no one was ever laid before, and they were able to bury Jesus Christ there. Now, because I have time, and we'll, I'll just read up the rest of this. I've got a few minutes left. Uh, it says, Then took they the body of Jesus and wound it in linen clothes with the spices as a manner of Jesus to bury. Now, in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new sepulcher where was never man yet laid. There laid they Jesus, therefore, because of the Jews' preparation day, for the sepulcher was nigh at hand. And it was convenient. There was a place that they needed to put them real, like, kind of quickly because, because the preparation day was there. And it was just about, I mean, it was like sundown. And their, their, day, their new day started at sundown. And that's when Jesus died because he was the Passover lamb. It was, you know, the Passover lamb was killed at even. And, I, you know, we see from Scripture here, it was the sixth hour when, when he was leaving Pilate, essentially, which the sixth hour of the day for them, the day started at sun up, or the hours would be, because um, they did like, they would do like 12-hour days and 12-hour nights, not 24-hour days, if that makes sense. So when they're saying it's the fourth watch of the night, they, the, I'm not going to get into the night hours, but the day hours, it would start at sun up, which would be roughly around 6 a.m. Right? 6 a.m., the sun comes up. Let's just use that as an average. So the sixth hour of the day for them would be around noon, as we would know it. And then it says from the sixth hour to the ninth hour, there was darkness upon the land. And that's when Jesus was, was hanging on the cross. He was crucified, which would be about 3 o'clock our time. And then 6 o'clock in the evening, 
is would have been the start of the next day and that would be the time when the Passover lamb is supposed to be killed so that's why I believe when Jesus actually died it was you know really close to that time because that's when he, when the Passover lamb was supposed to die Jesus was the Passover lamb and just that full fulfillment of scripture um, was probably right around that time turn if you were we're going to turn to one more place in the Old Testament Psalm 22 just to drive home some of this um, the scripture being fulfilled we're going to look at some of the scripture from Psalm 22 that was fulfilled when Jesus was crucified here Psalm 22 starting in verse number 1 the Bible reads my God my God why hast thou forsaken me why art thou so far from helping me and from the words of my roaring? This was obviously fulfilled. We, don't, we didn't read this in John 19, but in Matthew 27, 46, the Bible says, In about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is to say, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken, forsaken me? Fulfillment of Scripture. It was in you know, Psalm 22, verse 1 there. We see that. And Jesus is saying the exact same thing because he's fulfilling that scripture. Now, think, and this, I was going to do a whole sermon on this, but I decided against it because we're doing the, the crucifixion tonight. But God forsook Jesus Christ. Why did he do that? And, and real quickly, it's just because he was bearing the sins of the whole world. A person who dies in their sins that doesn't have forgiveness, that doesn't have Jesus Christ as their Savior, they are forsaken by God. And they're going to spend an eternity in hell as forsaken, given up on, and rejected. Because Jesus was bearing our sins, because He literally bare our sins in His own body, the Bible says in, in 1 Peter um, chapter 2, He bare our sins in His own body on the tree. So at that point, whenever that was, when he was actually embodied sin for us and became sin for us, that's when, when God forsook him. But that's also why um, you know, Jesus' soul went to hell when he died too because he was, again, he was bearing our sins. But um, let's keep reading here in Psalm 22, verse 2. I'm, I'm, I'll get through this track pretty quickly. He says, Oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but thou hearest not, and in the night season, and am not silent, but thou art holy. O thou that inhabitest the praises of Israel, our fathers trusted in thee, they trusted and thou didst deliver them. They cried unto thee and were delivered, they trusted in thee and were not confounded. But I am a worm and no man, a reproach of men and despised of the people. All they that see me laugh me to scorn. They shoot out the lip, they shake the head, saying, He trusted on the Lord that he would deliver him. Let him deliver him, seeing he delighted in him. See, we see the people reviling Jesus Christ as he's up on the cross. Matthew 27, 39 says, And they, they that passed by reviled him, wagging their heads. And Matthew 27, 42 says, He saved others himself he cannot save. And they're just mocking him and ridiculing him. And they're bringing up saying, Oh yeah, he was able to save others, but what about himself? If he be the king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross and, he will be, and we will believe. He trusted in God, let him deliver him now, if he will have him. For he said, I am the son of God. And they're just mocking him, saying, oh yeah, he's a king, he's the son of God. Well, why doesn't he come down now? They say, oh, oh yeah, if you were able to come down from that cross, then we'd believe you. But do you really think that they would? Even if he did that, do you really think that they'd believe him? Because I don't. If they don't believe him raising Lazarus from the dead... Why would they believe him coming down from that cross? They'd probably have some other explanation for it. They'd probably say that Satan got him off the cross. Because that's what they said about his healing powers, that it came from Satan, that he cast out devils by Beelzebub, prince of the devils. That's what they believed. So nothing that he could have done at that point for some of these people would have done any difference at all. And that's why it says um, when you remember the story of Lazarus and the rich man that went to hell, and Lazarus that went to heaven, and he says that um, the rich man is trying to get, he's like, you know, Father Abraham, you know, send someone so that, you know, send Lazarus back so he could tell my brethren. And he says, basically, they have, he has Moses and the prophets. He says, if he's not going to hear Moses, he's not going to hear the one came back from the dead. 
and um, they wouldn't have believed in Jesus even if he did come down from the cross. Psalm 22, 9 says, But thou art he that took me out of the womb. Thou didst make me hope when I was cast upon my brother's breasts, mother's breasts. I was cast upon thee from the womb. Thou art my God from my mother's belly. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, for there is none to help. Many bulls have compassed me. Strong bulls of Bashan have beset me round. They gaped upon me with their mouths as a ravening and a roaring lion. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted in the midst of my bowels. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue cleaveth to my jaws. And thou hast brought me into the dust of death. As he's hanging up on that cross, his bones are all out of joint. It says in verse 17, I, I may tell all my bones. That tell means count. I may tell all my bones. They look and stare upon me. This is the condition that Jesus was in. And that's why I want to finish up with this. He had the crown of thorns. We saw that. He was beaten. He was spit on. They punched him in the face. They put the purple robe on him. They hung him up on the cross. As he's on the cross, all of his bones are just out of joint from just hanging for hours with holes in his hands and in his feet. His heart was like, I mean, his heart's just melting inside of him. He's in despair. God, he said, why, why have you forsaken me? God's not even there to comfort him anymore. He's basically going through this alone. His strength, I mean, think about it, just having no strength. He couldn't even carry his cross the whole way. He had zero strength as he's hanging there. And he said, my tongue cleaveth to my jaws. That's because he was, his mouth was just so dry. He was so thirsty. And what they do? They gave him vinegar. I mean, he's experiencing everything. His, his whole soul, everything is just poured out. He is in the most miserable condition, probably just about humanly possible, after everything that he went through. And still, people are just reviling him and mocking him everything else and I mean he was he was beaten he was whipped so bad he was able to see his bones that's not just just you know a scrape or a scratch from a whip that's that's cutting through flesh and muscle and everything just to, to be able to see hey look there's some bones exposed <laughs> It says, for dogs have compassed me, the assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. I may tell all my bones. They look and stare upon me. Verse 18, they part my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture. And that's where we see, again, I mean, this is, this is Psalm 22. This was back King David, right? They had all the kings and everything else that happened in between that time before Jesus came and these words that have been written down for, for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, all of a sudden they all came to pass when Jesus was on that cross. This whole, I mean, this, this whole chapter is, applies to, to Jesus Christ as we, we, we saw those other places as well. Jesus Christ went through all of that and he was forsaken, but he was forsaken for us. And um, it is an incredible, incredible thing that he did for us. And we ought never to lose sight of that. This, this, this chapter is, is amazing. And this whole book is amazing. The whole Bible is amazing. What Jesus Christ did for us. This is a culmination. This is, this is what he did for us. Don't forget that. It's easy to be saved. Absolutely. But... Because it's so easy, don't let that th make you think that, like, like um, treat it lightly, your salvation. Don't, don't, don't let that, just because you're able to attain it so simply, by saying, well, I just got to put my faith in Jesus. Yes, yes. But the reason why it's so easy for you is because it was so hard for him when he poured out his blood. Not something to take lightly. Not something to say, oh, well, I can commit this sin because, hey, I'm saved anyways and I'm going to heaven. Because that's an easy attitude to get into. Say like, well, I mean, it's not like I'm going to go to hell for this, so I, I mean, I kind of want to do it anyways. No, we ought, we ought to look at this and, and be humbled and say, 
God really loves me to go through that. I'm going to change my life to do whatever it is that I can to show God how much I appreciate what he's done for me. Look at what he's done for you. Is it so much to ask to just listen to, to the few commandments that he's given us? I mean, this isn't a very thick book, and the part of it that's actually laws is a lot smaller than, than everything else that's written in here. Is it really that difficult? What I want today is just for us to, everybody, to get our hearts right and closer to just want to serve Jesus, to be thankful for what he's done for us and to show our appreciation for what he's done by reflecting that in our lives and in our adherence to his word and to serving him because of what he did for us. Use this hopefully to, 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 to help you to want to do even more when we realize everything that Jesus did for us. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you so much. It really is an unspeakable gift that you have for us, dear Lord, and it's hard to even fathom what Jesus Christ literally went through, what, what things were going on in his mind, what the, the, the painful experience that he had, and, and especially with his wisdom and his knowledge, dear Lord, with with, with Everything that you know, with, with even knowing the fact that what you were doing was for us and just, just watching people commit these heinous crimes against you and, and nailing you to the cross and whipping you, beating you up, spitting and everything, Lord, the whole, the whole package, Lord, help us never to, to be negligent to this or, or forgetful of what you've done, but that we can reflect on it and, and take the time due it's to put aside and to remember what you've done for us so that we can't look at the trivial things in our life and, and think how bad we have it and, oh, oh there's, there's all these problems that we have, Lord, when you went through all of this for us. Help us to get our life in perspective with what you've done for us, dear God. Help us to leave tonight and not just forget about your words, not just forget about your sacrifice, dear God. Help us to be mindful of these things. I pray that you would please just work with the Holy Spirit in our hearts every day when we start to have a bad attitude about our lives, dear Lord. Bring up this sacrifice back into our memory, dear God. We love you. We thank you, God. I pray that you would please help us to do great things, to bring honor and glory to your name, which is so much deserved. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.